Hi, everyone, to today's episode. A uh, very warm welcome. I also welcome Jaron, who is uh, our presenter today. Hi, Jaron. Hey, hi, Stefan. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining and thanks for having me here. Where are you located? I'm located uh, in Israel, uh, not far from Tel Aviv. You know that you're the first from Israel uh, in, in our show. We had so many yes, but not from Israel so far. You're the first one. <laughs> Hopefully, <laughs> Good. Not well, I hope not the last. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, I will work on that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, thanks for everyone who have joined us today. Uh, again, for all those who did it the first time, as you remember, we have uh, a code A section in the navigation bar. If you check the navigation bar, you will see that you can ask questions during the presentation. Uh, so Jaron was already informed that there might be questions in between as well. So don't hesitate. If you have questions, just go ahead. There are no silly, silly things uh, to ask. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm going to start with Paul as always, because we are curious to understand what kind of background you have. It's, it helps us a little bit to focus on the right things when we talk here. And also, Jaron, for, for just be better informed about what kind of focus we should have. Um, Jaron, so um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing on a daily basis. Me personally, you mean? Yeah, you personally. Not in the private life, but it was in the working life. Right. Well, so, you know, I run uh, uh, the product and strategy team uh, at uh, Wint. Wint is Water Intelligence. We're a company that applies uh, a whole bag of technological tricks to solve water-related problems in facilities. We'll dive into that some more. So, you know, as, as you know, running this team, I, you know, I guide the product direction, the strategy, the technologies that we employ, uh, and it's really interesting. <laughs> Yeah, I believe so. I mean, water is a pretty important thing these days. We discussed it a little bit before we started. Yes, we have some water scarcity uh, in Bavaria uh, the last couple of years, which was just like, oh, what's happening here? The water becomes an essential resource, isn't it? So there are two things about water. The first is it's an essential resource, right? I mean, think of yourselves, you know, just one day without water, you know, even if you've got drinking water, which of course is, is critical for us to live, but you know, a day without water, it's something, you know, it's, it's almost like air to us. We expect it anytime. Um, and the flip side, water is also actually very dangerous. People don't always consider that, but water in a building, when water spills in a building, my God, I mean, that, I mean, that will destroy buildings. It's kind of the silent killer. Uh, in fact, uh, some insurance companies we talk to say water is the new fire. It causes so much damage in buildings when it spills that it, it just creates a big, you know, big, big problem for everyone. So it has, you know, these two sides of the coin. I mean, I, I sometimes uh, know what I, I personally am sometimes afraid of something happening in the water system in the house uh, because it's uh, sometimes difficult to detect it. So it's it's not a problem, which is I would say it's far away from me personally as well. Uh, but uh, what I found just interesting is that it costs so much uh, in, if you calculate and ag aggregate the data over time. Uh, you, you talked a, bit, a little bit about toilet flushes. I think this is something which might be common sometimes at the working place. At least I have the experience. Sometimes mm -hmm. I saw it running and running and running all the time. So this seems to be not, not a simple problem. It's not a simple problem, but a very uh, costly problem, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's so mundane, nobody thinks about it, nobody gives it a second thought, it seems like a little wetness, right? And, and this is, you know, just to clarify, that's, you know, just one, one way of water to get wasted. But if you do the math, you know, this stuff goes at 500, 800 liters an hour, do the math, and before you know it, you're looking at 10, 20,000 euros per year for just one of those. It's a lot of money and it's an enormous amount of water. And this is just an example of the many ways water gets wasted in buildings. In fact, one of the things we found is uh, almost every building we go into, in every geography, in every place, uh, about 25% of the water that goes into buildings goes to waste for, all, for many, many stupid little reasons like you know, what I just mentioned. So you know, at 25%, that's a lot. And many parts of the world today are becoming water stressed. We were just talking about this, right? I mean, even London is, is going to be water stressed in a few years, um, let alone Western Europe that's experiencing, you know, huge drought this year, uh, worse than anything, you know, that's been experienced in the past, uh, I don't know, 2000 years or so, I've seen some articles say. So, you know, these kinds of wastes are, are terrible. 
you know, 25% waste when water is becoming such a problem is just, you know, very unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, 25% is, oh, wow, that's pretty much. Uh, I didn't expect that number, to be honest. Uh, just going go, go back to a little bit to, to Wind and the company you're working for. Uh, how large is your team? Uh, we're a startup company, so we're f about 40 people, 45. Oh, that's a lot. Okay. Uh, but you're working internationally, right? Oh, yes. We have customers all across Europe, uh, uh, America. Absolutely. We're very international. I, I love the term water intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> I like that very much. Uh, if, if you look at the skill set of the people you're working with, what is the typical skill set? What, what do you need to work on water intelligence? A lot of things, actually. It's a very diverse environment. So, you know, at the core of everything is the algorithms and the people who write these, uh, uh, you know, these intelligence pieces that can analyze water flows. Um, uh, but you also need to install equipment and you also need to write software that is not, you know, at the core of algorithms, but, you know, stuff that drives it, right? The cloud, uh, mobile apps. So, um, and then you need to, you need to have that hardware and you need to install it. So we've got, you know, we have people uh, working with us whose experiences or, or, or education is uh, water engineers. And we employ third-party plumbers, which I never expected to do in a high-tech company. I mean, it's not our employees, but we work with plumbers as well. To put that intelligence in place, you need to do some plumbing work. Interesting. So coming back to the poll, I closed it already. I would like to say that we have about 70% yeah, tech stack, so really tech people. That's interesting this time. And uh, from the mixture of, you know, of level of expertise, 30% uh, uh, novice to the field of machine learning, for example, and uh, advanced we have 71%. So it's, I think it's a good mixture of very professional people. Uh, let's, let's try to keep it uh, still simple for anyone. So even novice will just follow up on that's what you're talking. And uh, yeah, I'm really happy to have you here and I would like to give you the floor now. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, maybe I'll share some slides and uh we'll go through those and you know as, as you said stefan you know everybody feel free to ask questions you know uh i don't like to talk for a full hour straight i don't know if it'll be a full hour but anyway feel free to ask questions so went water intelligence that's us uh let me kind of go over what it is that we do uh and what markets we operate in so we provide solutions related to water in four different market segments one is the construction, construction building construction. Uh, the second is commercial buildings, um, you know, office buildings, residential buildings, apartments, flats, and so on, and industry. And when we look at these four markets, we basically do three things for them. Uh, and we do all of that by employing a generic technology that is used for monitoring water flows within pipes and understanding what that means. We never, you know, I never thought about it before I, I started wind, but when, uh, when water flows through a pipe, it creates a water flow signal. And that signal can be analyzed in, in many ways using many techniques uh, from you know, signal processing uh, to machine learning, to AI, all sorts of tricks and methodologies that can be arranged together to understand at the end of the day what that flow tells us and the flow will tell us a lot of things and that's you know that's the core technology and if you say a signal does it mean does it does it mean an audio uh, or what, what is a signal no no it means the water flow rate i'll show you some charts later but okay. when i say a signal you basically look at the flow of water over time and you analyze it as if it were a signal I mean, it's not really a signal, but it, it, in, it includes all the characteristics of a signal. You know, it's a graph, you know, it, it, it has amplitudes, it has frequencies, it has all sorts of things like that. Um, so we do three things with this. The first is we uh, prevent water damage, as, as some of you may have experienced, I hope not. But, you know, if you've got a water leak in your home or in an office building, the damage can be massive you know this is in terms of actually financial cost uh worldwide this is more expensive than fires uh except you know when you have a fire everybody knows people's life get put in risk 
you know, fire engines roar through the streets with their sirens wailing. When you have water leaking in the building, no, none of that happens, but the financial damage is there anyway. I've seen customers who have had damage in the tens of millions of dollars for a single water leak event. Somebody, some pipe breaks, somebody forgets a hose, whatever, tens of millions of dollars. Um, so we help prevent that. Uh, we also help with sustainability. And you know, we all know, you know water stress is becoming a big deal. Uh, people care, companies care, uh, you know, we as consumers care, you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to buy consumer products for a company that behaves badly uh, towards the environment. So if you're wasting water, if you're, you know, drying up my lakes, uh, I'm, you know, I'm not going to buy your product. So companies care. Uh, and sustainability, we, we all know, right, over the past year, I think the importance of, of sustainability to all of us has really grown and water is a part of that. And finally, we can use that analysis of the water flow um, uh, to do things, some of you may be familiar with the term industry 4.0. Industry 4.0 are ways to analyze industrial operations and improve them using various uh, data processing techniques. And when does industry 4.0 for water? Which means we look at these water flows and we tell you things about how your industrial process works. Is it effective? Is it wasting water? Do you have faulty equipment? Uh, and that sort of thing. So you know, we're using that context as well. Um, by the way, I'm, we, we've been recognized pretty broadly. I should have had the slide here, I think. You know what, bear with me for a second. I'll show you a slide from a different presentation just to show off for a moment. <laughs> So we'll do this a little, a little not, uh, uh, you know, informally, but um, I think, you know, bragging a little bit is okay. Um, so where's that slide? Here it is. Water guy has always been fast with slides, as you do. <laughs> Sorry, say again? I say a product guy is always fast with slides. So it's just like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's good. Thank you. So, you know, we've been, you know, we've been recognized quite broadly by, and, and you'll see it's it's interesting set of, uh, of, of people who have recognized us. So, uh, you know, the Energy Managers Association has recognized us for our contribution to water conservation. Uh, insurance Times, kind of, uh, you know, the leading uh, magazine of the insurance industry has recognized us as their favorite or, or you know, the, the technology that contributes most to the reduction of claims in 2019. Uh, and then, you know, we've got a Construction Tech Magazine, uh, award us as one of the top 50 companies uh, actually this year. And, and, you know, Pure Tech Magazines. Uh, so we've got Fast Company, for those of you familiar with that magazine. Uh, awarded us as one of the top 10 AI companies in the world. And CB Insights, just, you know, 10 days ago or so, awarded us as one of the top 100 most influential AI companies. So, you know, a little bit of bragging rights. <laughs> um, and, you know, if, if you go to our website, you'll see connections to some of these articles. And actually, there's a pretty cool CNN uh, spot about when. So, you know, you'll see it on our website. We're not going to show it here. But three minutes to tell the story, pretty interesting. Um, so back to, uh, to our original slide deck. So here's what we deploy uh, when we go into a facility. And I'll, I'll show this uh, in, a, in a building, but you know, it's quite similar if we go to a, uh, you know, a construction site or to a, an, an a manufacturing facility. It's, it's about the same. So what do we do? We essentially have uh, two components to our system. You know, one is a, is, is a water flow meter connected to a, a processing unit, which connects to the cloud, and an automated shutoff valve. Uh, that's really all there is to it from a physical perspective. And we'll install this, you know, if you're in an office building, we'll install this, let's say, one per floor, or on the entrance to the building, or on, on your uh, HVAC system, on, on your, um, you know, uh, air conditioning system. So we'll install that and the system goes in there. Uh, it knows, we tell it in advance what type of environment it works on. And I'll show you some of these environments so you'll understand the complexity of the problem. And we tell it you're on an environment of type X. And from that point on, it just starts to learn, understand what is normal, what is abnormal for that situation. And um, uh, within three to four weeks, depending on the specifics of the environment, uh, it knows, 
what are the normal patterns and what are the right behaviors in that situation. And at that point in time, it has learned, the machine learning has learned the normals for that environment, and it can start identifying anomalies. And it doesn't matter if you're in a, you know, in a construction or, or office building or uh, a production line, you know, it'll start identifying problems and alerting staff when stuff goes wrong. And it can also make a valve shutoff decision if it thinks things are really bad. Um, so we've saved so many buildings with this. And I'll show you, I'll, I'll tie all of this together in a few minutes so you can see how this ties into what I mentioned before about signal processing and, you know, understanding that water flow signal. Uh, this also goes to the cloud. So, you know, the whole system is an IoT system, uh, Internet of Things, stuff is driven into the cloud. Um, you know, it connects to external systems for reporting and that sort of thing. It provides alerts on the mobile phone. Um, and the whole communication happens over the cellular network. So now let's dive into some of the technology. Or actually, sorry, before that, let's talk about why these things are complicated. Because, you know, it's... You may think to yourself, all right, no problem, right? You know, so I've got the water going to the kitchen. And if I see water flowing at more than five, let's say 500 liters per hour for more than 15 minutes, then I know it's a problem because that should never happen. And that's kind of what some people think when they try to go into this market. The, the thing is, it's much more complex than that, actually. So the first thing about the complexity is what is water in these facilities? And in fact, water is not what most of us think of. You know, we think of water in the building as the, the, the pipes that feed our kitchens, restrooms, showers, and maybe irrigation. The reality is most buildings you go into have six, seven different water systems. So you have, you have the system that feeds what we call the domestic water, and that's the water that we all see. We have water that feeds uh, fire sprinklers. We have water that feeds fire hydrants. Air conditioning in buildings is many times, especially in large buildings, actually water driven. Uh, so the heat from the building is actually cleared away uh, through water, not through air. You know, in our homes, we may have air-based air conditioning. In buildings, it's water-based. And you've got really big pipes that drive enormous amounts of water very quickly through the building. When one of those explodes, and I've seen that, wow, you know, you've got no chance of stopping it. By the time you figure out where the shutoff valve is, the, the building is, is you know, decimated. Um, I mean, we're talking 10, 20,000 liters per hour, very fast flows. And even if you stop the main feed, there's so much pipe at such a high, uh, such a big diameter in the building that, you know, the water will continue pouring. Everything above you will continue pouring through that broken pipe and you still have massive damage. So, you know, that's another type of system. Uh, those of you familiar with, I don't know how many of you have thought, you know, you go into a high rise hotel, you turn on the shower, and you get hot water instantly. You do that at home and you have to wait a minute or two for the water to heat up. And the reason for that is that there's in, in hotels, uh, there is a special hot water system. It actually circulates hot water from a boiler in the basement throughout the building and the water keeps flowing. And when you want hot water, you're actually pulling water from that circuit that's you know maybe three meters away from you. So you don't have to wait. So that's another special type of water system and it goes on, right? So this, this gets complicated. Every one of those has its own special behavior and it does things differently and normal in that case is not normal in other cases and so on. Uh, so that's one, one source of complexity. The other source of complexity is the customers that we serve. So, you know, when you go into buildings, the people you serve are the people who maintain the building. You know, they're not software engineers. They're not, uh, you know, advanced technologically. They maintain buildings. And that means they don't want you to, to complicate their lives. They need very simple solutions. But as we said, the problem is complicated. And a simple solution means uh, no false alerts, or I mean, nothing has no false alerts, but minimize it. You, you false alert me twice a day and, you know, I'm turning off your system because I'm not going to be running around, you know, uh, concerned that I've got a water spill in the building twice a day. That's not, you know, <laughs> that's not going to pass. And um, on the flip side, if something happens, then you need to stop it quickly and effectively. You can't wait 30 minutes. You wait 30 minutes, the water's out of the pipe. It's too late. So, you know, this combination means that you're actually in a very tight uh, straitjacket, if you will, forcing you between low false positives, uh, high detection rates, 
and all of that in a very complex environment. You know, think of an office building, right? Uh, you've got people in the kitchen and then the dishwasher and then, you know, three people going to the bathroom and think of the, the water flow that happens at that moment. How can you tell if it's good or not? How can you decide to stop it immediately or not? And, and that's where the pro problem gets, gets difficult. Um, so let's take a look at, at a bit of that problem uh, and a bit of the, you know, get a little more technical about this. So this is obviously tutorial based and tutorial level. It's the simplest things. Um, but what we're showing here are three charts. Uh, each of these charts on the X axis has um, uh, the water has time. So this is in on the Y axis, we're seeing the rate of water flow. So, you know, the simplest is we flush a toilet. We're back to toilets again, right? <laughs> so you flush a toilet and the tank fills up. That's all that happens from the water system perspective. There's a little more though. If you look at this little spike, this little spike tells us, uh, it, it comes from the fact that the pipe leading from the water system into the tank is empty for the first split second. And then there's less pressure and that re reduced pressure means that water flows a little bit faster. So we're seeing that spike and it takes that split second until the, you know, it's a, what is it? I don't know, a half meter pipe or something. Uh, that half meter pipe fills up really quickly and then the water drops to a stable flow rate. But that creates a fingerprint, right? Now we have a fingerprint of this, of this specific water activity. It's got the spike, it's got that certain flow rate, it's got the duration, the total volume. So a few simple attributes that can be learned for this specific pattern. And of course, we're not going to define a few attributes for every pattern. There's, you know, there's, there are generalizations around this. But as people, we understand why this is telling of a specific water uh, activity happening. Now let's take a look at the chart below. It gets a little more, more complicated. So here we've got, you know, as the base here, as this base uh, rectangle is another toilet flush. We see the spike looks a little different. It's very clear to the eye that this is different than the one above. On top of it, we've got this hump. This hump is the person opening the tap and washing their hands. And so now we have two water events layered on top of each other. Of course, as people, you know, as people, we have superb signal processing capabilities. We see this, we look at it, we understand immediately. Yeah. So I can tell you very easily how much water flowed into the tank and how much water was used by the, uh, uh, by the tap for hand washing. And, you know, we see this immediately. This is actually two signals layered one on top of the other. And of course, life gets a lot more complicated than one or two signals. Things get really complicated. Below, you're seeing something more complex. This is a washing machine. And this is actually from an industrial washing process. So, you know, we've got cycles starting and stopping and dropping to zero and dropping, but not to zero and spiking and all sorts of stuff. So, and, and you think about it, you can pretty quickly, you know, based on this, start to invent scenarios and see how complex this stuff gets. And the trick is, how do you learn what's normal and how do you identify an anomaly? So let me show you two examples for anomalies. And, you know, we align them here in this chart along the lines of, of the key things we do for customers, right? So the first is, um, uh, you know, that stuck toilet, that proverbial stuck toilet in the building. And it's really simple to see what's happening. So yet again, we're seeing that pattern, you know, flush, hand wash, stop of the toilet, except it doesn't drop to zero because that seal is not working and the water keeps flowing. And we go in and we see a little bit of wetness. That's all we see, you know, we've all seen right? a little bit of wetness. But that wetness means water is flowing at what is it here? I think around four or 500 liters per hour constantly. Now there's a pattern here to this, right? We understand what this pattern is. We also understand that this is anomalous relative to a simple toilet flush. And so the system looks at it. It takes some time. It doesn't alert immediately to not, you know, uh, create false alerts. But after a short while, after a few minutes, an alert is sent out and we've identified this anomaly. And by doing this, you know, the guy on the seventh floor who's managing the facility says, oh, I've got, a, I've got a problem toilet. And he goes there and then five minutes of work and probably, you know, a year of a little seal fixes a problem. If you do the math, this problem would cost them probably many thousands of euros in water, let alone the environmental impact. So, you know, this is how we tie in this signal processing AI capability into something very concrete and useful for the user. 
Um, if you look below, this is a different scenario altogether. And you know, even if you just quickly glance at this chart, you'll see something very different. This chart shows a pipe exploding in a wall. Now, in reality, pipes oftentimes do not just explode. Uh, there's a little bit of a degradation, you know, rust or a bad fitting or something happens to the pipe and it starts to degrade. And at some point it starts to drip. That drip, as you can see at the start of this chart, is, is really tiny, right? This is, you know, drip, drip, drip. Nobody sees it. It may be getting some wall a bit wet. You don't really notice it. Over time, and this actually, you know, in this example, it takes a few hours. In other examples, it, it can take months, right? That pipe continues to degrade. The water pressure degrades the pipe at that location where it's already broken a little bit. And over time, it becomes worse. And you can see how very gradually this flow becomes faster and faster and faster. And at some point, and now this is the trick about false alerts versus detection, right? I mean, am I going to say this is a leak right here? Probably not, because maybe it's just a tap dripping. But at some point, the pattern becomes obvious and the risk becomes significant. So after not that many liters of water, so the floor did get a little bit wet. Let's not get this wrong, right? It doesn't keep everything dry perfectly. But there's a little bit of water and the system sends an alert. Nothing happens. Nobody comes to fix the problem and the problem continues. The pipe continues to degrade and you can actually see how these pipes you know, escalate very quickly. At some point here, you can see this uh, step function. Uh, I don't know what happened, but maybe a piece of the pipe just flew because of the water pressure or something like that. And the gap became bigger and flow became faster. And after a while, the system says, all right, you didn't do anything. This is escalating, bang, it closes the valve and that's it. And I, you know, I probably can't even count the number of times we've saved buildings through this kind of process from massive, massive damage. And so I think this demonstrates the complexity of the technical problem with uh, the risk and you know how you really need to perform effectively. You know, if we didn't shut the valve off here but waited another hour, at this point, flow rates are not insignificant. You know, you'd start seeing real damage, you know, if we wait another hour. So the tighter you can get this, the faster you can alert without false positives. That is the balance that we live every day. Um, you know, a little bit about our, our algorithm architecture. So there's algorithms that run on the device. There are algorithms that run in the cloud. We have a, a, a you know, a hybrid architecture for our algorithms. You know, some things you need on the device because they need to be high speed, independent of communication. This is mission critical. I'm not going to wait for communication if the cellular network is not performing and let a building, you know, get destroyed. So I need that processing power on the ground. Uh, Real-time response, uh, and it continuously adapts locally, right? So the algorithms continue to learn locally based on the normals and how they evolve at that specific location. You know, during COVID, uh, when offices emptied, we saw some real shifts, right? All of a sudden, water consumption dropped in many buildings. And then locations that came back to work, you can see another shift as, as consumption increased. So the systems adapt continuously to whatever's going on. Um, it's all, of course, based on single device data and it's all localized. In the cloud, of course, you can do a lot more, right? I mean, you can correlate data between different systems. You can, uh, uh, you can do processing that's you know, not limited by processing power. Um, you can be either real time or offline and take your time and, and do a lot of processing offline. Um, and you can correlate data for many devices. You know, if I'm seeing weather patterns in a specific area, they will definitely impact water flow patterns, right? Think of the simplest example is irrigation. Um, so you can see impact across many systems in the same weather, uh, weather location or similar weather locations, uh, and they are telling. And so that can help you identify that there's a broad phenomenon happening and you know you're you seeing some differences in behavior are probably indicative of, of a broad pattern so you don't need to uh, to alert if everybody says something's wrong or something is different then you know they kind of voted that this is legitimate um you know i i, I won't dive into the technicalities of how and what we process of course you know some of this is you know is is, is you know our, our, our trade secrets but you know i think the, the important point for us to say is 
it's a whole bag of tricks, right? You know, these problems, you, you choose technologies, it's not a single technology. So signal, process, signal processing obviously is a part of it. You know, machine learning to adapt and to understand what makes sense and what not. Uh, we cluster data. Actually, we do a lot of statistical analytics as well and, and use statistics, you know, things like I mentioned before, you know, many systems over time, stuff like that. So, you know, we do a lot of statistical analysis. So all of these are used in different situations in different contexts to, to you know, provide this, this analysis. Here's an example from industry. Sorry, sorry for interrupting you. Can you go back to slide seven for a second? <clears throat> Just to, yeah, one, one step back. Oh, one step back, this one? Uh, to seven, yes, thank you. Um, because Roland had a question, I think it, it really much uh, adds to what I have a, a question as well. He said, how do you distinguish a leak from change in behavior of water consumption as it changes slowly over time? Yeah, that's a good point. So you may be learning a bad phenomenon, right? Uh, if you learn what's going on, you may learn a bad phenomenon. And that's, you know, part of the trick is to, on the one hand, oh, sorry, on the one hand, look on short-term changes and identify them as anomalies, but also you need to look at different time perspectives, right? Over a long period of time, if you see that something has happened over a long period of time, you know, depending on the scenario and the situation, you should consider whether it is a legitimate change. For example, you know, seasonal changes in air conditioning are legitimate because, you know, as weather gets warm, you will see more usage. So we actually use external inputs such as weather data uh, to, to know that this change is legitimate. But if you're seeing, you know, uh, changes in rate in an industrial environment in a process that should be very repetitive, then you know that that change over time may be a degradation of a pump or a valve or something like that. So, you know, this is not, you know, a comprehensive answer, but it really depends on the specifics of the environment, understanding where you're living and using as much external data to help you uh, identify these long-term gradual changes that may be legit or not legit. Interesting. One of the slides before, in, in combination with what you now say, uh, it's it, it's interesting for me. Are you actually training on machines which might be connected, or behavioral patterns that are connected, which might be connected to water? Uh, because it looks like this is like a huge field of things which can be done with water. So if you think about, let's think about the washing machine you mentioned. Yes. So we have at least six, seven programs which might change patterns of behavior, yes, and it's it's changing. And do you train on, on that machine level, so to say, which might be using water, or how does it work? Uh, so, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure I, I fully follow yeah. the question. So you're looking at signals in, in the water system itself, in the in central pipeline, basically. Uh, and you, you look at different uh, ways of consuming water, say in a household or in an office. And uh, you mentioned a uh, washing machine, as an example, a coffee machine, uh, washing my hands, a toilet, whatever. So um, in, in, your, in your way of looking at the problem of water leaks or water problems, uh, something like that, uh, are you looking on a machine level? So because all those kind of machines connected to water have different patterns, uh, do you have to train on the patterns for machines or is it, is it more kind of general noise you're looking at? So we look at attributes of the signal as it relates to the specific environment, right? So, you know, uh, an operational building with, the, when you look at domestic water, has certain attributes that we've learned over time, and the algorithms are adjusted to those normal attributes. It's very different, you know, I'll show you in a moment what happens in industry, it's totally different, it's crazy. Right, you don't see these kinds of flows. And so we understand the kind of phenomenon there. We have that engineering understanding of, of the phenomenon. And then we apply algorithms that are slightly different in that environment. So we use the machine learning within a context. So at, at, at least at the beginning, you might have, you need to have a situation which is just perfectly normal, right? To say, this is the yes. situation that needs to be perfect, no problems. And this is just like, the general pattern of behavior of signal in that environment. That's right, correct. or I assume it's normal, and if it's not, then I'll be corrected over time. Yeah, okay. 
So I, I may make an assumption. Mm -hmm. And how it's the only way to deal with this, right? Because you don't know if there's a problem. So. And how do you recognize if there are changes in that context? So I mean, say we have more machines taking water from the system. Uh, if this is a change in the environment itself. To recognize it without doing having false alerts. So sometimes it will, you know, a, a massive, uh, you know, in terms of water consumption, a massive change, uh, abrupt, will possibly result in a false alert. Um, you know, it's it's very hard. You know, if somebody does an external uh, impact on your on your system, and that impact is not known to the system, it will most likely, and, and it's not just for us, it will most likely be identified as a, a false alert. Yeah. Uh, things are rare, they're quite rare, yeah. and it's something you live with, right? Um, I get more and more a better understanding of how challenging the environment is to, to do all that what you're doing, right? <laughs> yeah. It's not that simple. Uh, Roland right. had an, uh, a follow-up question. Do you need to train the model for different geographies, cultures, industries, when have one model for everything or the model for say each building? The models are generic. Um, okay. the, their learnings are you know, adjustable and they will adjust for the local situation. All well, interesting, thanks. So we spoke about this. Here's, you know, I mentioned industrial, take a look at this. You can see how dramatically different this flow looks because an industrial process is very, operates very differently. So you can see all sorts of spikes and jumps and obviously it has its own attributes and you can see a process operating, a green process operating here and the red process you know, below, you can, see, you can see the green process and the red process and above you can see actually processes that are layered on one of the others. And so there's a lot of, you're trying to break up the signal and understand what's coming from what and learn uh, this. So you get this combinatorial impact of signal, which also creates algorithmic complexities. Um, and then you start to identify anomalies within those things as they operate layered on one of the other. Um, yeah, not so interesting. I'll skip that. So I'll, I'll, um, I'll talk about um, to customers, so we'll just see how you know how all of this technology eventually helps a customer, you know, a real world customer. And here's you know here's this is a company called Hartford Insurance, a fairly large insurance company out of uh, the U.S. And you know they wanted to provide insurance against uh, or or to improve uh, their payouts for insurance uh, and and you know, reduce the damages that their customers suffer from. So they pulled us in, they installed us in this building and uh, their facility management team wanted to see how good the system was. And so the amazing thing is over about a year, they never had a single you know, pipe rupture that could destroy the building or, or damage it. So they were lucky. However, you know, un, unexpected to them, they identified over a hundred non-damaging leaks. Toilets, air conditioning systems, you name it. Everything in that building was leaking water. Back to that 25% waste comment we had before. And they didn't know any of this. They identified five malfunctions in the, in the equipment in the building from a boiler to heating systems to cooling systems. And over this period of eight, eight months, yeah, I thought it was 10. Over a period of eight months, uh, they saved half a million gallons, which is about you know, five, six million liters of water save tens of thousands of dollars in water, and they dropped the baseline of their water consumption by a full 15%. And in fact, you know, many corporations today have sustainability goals. They managed to drop these 15%, uh, which was originally the company's goal to achieve in three years. So that was done in eight months. So, you know, an example of how all of this algorithms and technology and alerts eventually, you know, help save water. <laughs> And, you know, same happens at HP across Europe, you know, we're installed with them in Spain and Italy and Sofia and many other locations in, in Europe, uh, tens of buildings, hundreds of systems. Uh, they managed to cut their overall water consumption by 27%. Uh, and so, you know, very significant. Uh, 
they're basically returning, you know, the cost of the system every month. And um, it's hard to say what a water, what a damaging water leak would have cost, right? It's an argument we can have until we get red in the face, because you know what would have happened is always a fun, a fun discussion. Uh, but you know the estimate is hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, of of damages prevented in these buildings over a few years. So that's us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Yell. If you, if you just go back for a second to, to the cases, which is just interesting. Um, so some practical questions, and of course, and uh, which helps a little bit to better understand what, what you're doing. Uh, Christian is asking, do the customers buy the sensors or do you offer a service and the customer only pays for alerts? So what's so the business model? Yeah, so the sensors are pretty uh, standard off the shelf water flow meters or valves. It's not our sensors actually, we buy them from third parties. Customers can buy them directly. Uh, usually customers want us to, to provide this to them because it makes their life easier. They don't need to go buy stuff. Yeah. Uh, so we sell them this at, at pretty much what it costs us and we offer an ongoing service. Okay. And uh, Roland is asking, do you have customers in Switzerland? Not yet, no. So we can, we can solve a problem, right? <laughs> Absolutely, we'd love to. <laughs> uh, just just uh, for me, because you, you're on a startup as well as you said, when, when did you start it? When have you been founded? Uh, the company was founded quite a few years ago, actually, in, in 2014. Uh, it took a few years to develop the technology. Uh, actually, I, I came in three years ago, and uh, you know we pulled the company into the uh, industrial and commercial space, and you know went, it's, it's going nicely. The, uh, I would be interested in uh, you know this is uh, it requires a lot of learning over time, right? So the model gets better, of course. It's net effect, so you have more. Customers, you have more problems. You have you better, you better get in predicting. Um, so, do you do, uh, do you have knowledge about the beginning of that all? So how did you start? Did you did you cause problems to find problems, or was it just we had two houses where we tested it? <laughs> how did it start? You know, you start by collecting data from you know friendly locations. You have your thesis and and how this should work. Uh, you put it in place. And then you go and, and you know you correct your mistakes because uh, you will have made mistakes. Uh, so you need to come with a strong theory and a strong uh, platform that solves this theory, but is flexible enough to be adjustable over the, the initial phases. Of the uh, I get it. So it's it's for me it's a cool learning, uh, to be honest, to to look at all that. Um, is there something like a perfect customer for you? So like. Uh, a, a kind of use case where you say this is a perfect environment for us to help. Yeah, I don't think so. You know, we do everything from universities to private homes to apartments to uh, you know commercial buildings. Um, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you say, uh, how long does the training take uh, usually? About a month, give or take a, a month. month. A month, okay. So that's uh, for the implementation. Uh, you said twenty five percent of water is usually wasted, a uh, shocking number. So it's actually any kind of building which might need uh, help, right? Every building we've gone into wastewater. water, <laughs> absolutely. Uh, but what is the, the minimum investment amount you have to, uh, to invest to use the system like yours? It's hard to say, you know, it all depends on how many systems you're going to deploy. You don't deploy just one, so it's hard to say. Uh, is it also for private private living places, or do you think it's more for economy? So you know the solution works in private living places, but you know since we focus on on more commercial activities, uh, and you know we do think we have a, a unique solution, uh, the focus is uh, kind of higher end. So absolutely, you know if you look in London, a uh, place that has super expensive apartments, we're in, we're installed in many of them. Yeah, uh, but you know, most people probably would not invest uh, that much. Are you operating from Tel Aviv, or do you have subsidiaries in all those countries? You we know? have subsidiaries in London and in the U.S. Oh, yeah, cool. Yeah, and uh, 
Roland is also had one question more. Maybe I missed it. He's asking, what, what is the business model or for what do you charge? So it's a software as a service model. Yeah. Uh, it depends on the specifics of the, uh, of the facility and the location. Uh, could be tens of dollars uh, per month for a system. Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Jan, again, for, for taking the time this evening. Thanks, guys, uh, uh, for all the questions you had. Uh, fantastic questions, as always. I liked it uh, much. And um, I hope we can see each other again. I, I, I'm sure, besides of CNN talking about you, I, I'm sure I get more knowledge about you and your company in the media in the upcoming <laughs> years. I'm sure. Yeah. Thanks again. Well, for taking thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Bye bye. Yeah. Goodbye, everyone, and I wish you a good night. And hope we see each other again next time. So, goodbye.